Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Welcome everybody, this is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. I'm right now here again in my cramped study on a Saturday and I do have a guest here who's actually from Munich because I discovered I don't have enough startups from Munich in my interviews. So I reached out to Munich startups and they connected me to you. Janosch, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Completely my pleasure. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm Janosch from Crash Test Security, and I founded the company three years ago, and we're actually doing automated vulnerability testing for web applications. That is a lot of nerd talk. Let us later get into what it actually means. But first, you, you, you are not like set on a certain um, track from your education, because I realized you have a bachelor's in computer science as well as in education and how did you then end up in cybersecurity? Uh... Good question. So basically I yeah, was interested in computers for a long time already. Before my studies I was abroad in Uganda and I met somebody there, a famous hacker from the US. So I already got a grasp on security somehow. And then I started uh, my studies in Munich in computer science. And during my bachelor thesis, I recognized, okay, only computers, that's nice, but I also want to do something with people. And then next to my informatics master, I decided to do a bachelor in pedagogics, uh, so educations. Um, but basically, the IT is my major, and everything else is just an addition. Hmm. I see, because when I saw your CV, I thought, hmm, I would have thought he would open something like an uh, uh, online university or something, but not cybersecurity. Um, you met an American hacker in Uganda. Um, that, that's not the first place you think about of US-based hackers. Um, how did it happen? And can you unveil his real, his real identity here? Yeah, sure. Uh, his name is Johnny Long, and he's the founder of Hackers for Charity. And he was actually doing charity work uh, in Uganda, um, which was actually kind of what I was doing there as well. Um, and we met uh, as we both were um, having Linux user groups there, and we were happened to have a have an event together. Ah, I see. And how long have you been in Uganda? For a year. Oh, that's quite a long time. And it, it, it's a very nice area there, right? Yeah, so um, a lot of national parks. Um, I basically was there as a volunteer. And when I was not working, I took a lot of holidays and was traveling around looking at the animals. Um, it was, was really awesome. Have been personally to Tanzania and Zanzibar and can strongly recommend this area of Africa, especially since it was my honeymoon. Um, that set aside, what did you learn and how did it bring you to your current company? Uh, so in Uganda, it was merely like uh, getting getting the interest also for, for security there. But then basically... During my studies, I set a focus on IT security. It was just the topic that I was really interested in. And at some point, I had a seminar together with some colleagues called Secure Coding, where we were actually supposed to develop an um, online banking web application. And then we had to hack the banks of the other student teams. And it was a lot of fun, but we really recognized there's no good tools that support developers into developing secure application. There are a lot of tools for penetration testers, like for security engineers, when they are really doing the, the hacking manually. But if I'm a developer, I have some other requirements. I basically want to focus on my features, on my application, 
and in addition, the software needs to be secure. And that was where the, the business idea came from. And in the end, the pedagogy is not that much off because still we have to train users, we have to work with people because we don't do security just for the sake of security, but we want to do it so that people have secure applications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Uh, it's it's about training people. I see this in many corporates uh, these days. Um, your, your frame has been jumping a little bit. Sorry for everybody who is watching this YouTube interview. Um, the, the problem is you don't have any um, high speed uh, connections to your office right now. So we are relying on copper cable which varies unfortunately a lot in quality nonetheless at least you, you you're jumping around a little bit right yeah that's why we have an office my, right in the center of munich because that's where there is no internet well fortunately there's no internet in munich <laughs> um And uh, you re uh, so basically it, it was like a game when uh, one group of uh, coders set up a bank and the other one tried to get in. So um, how did this start your company idea? So basically the first thing we had to do there was automating um, our report because we were handing in two reports within the semester. Both were about 120 pages. So we didn't want to write that all that manually. Yeah. So we started writing some some scripts for automating the reporting. And then when we were finding vulnerabilities in the applications, we had an easier way for the for the reporting, for showing what we actually did and how the others could then resolve that. And we saw that as a developer, basically that's what I need during my day-to-day -day work. I want to work on a feature, I want to work on a functionality, and then if I do a mistake, which is security relevant, I need to have a report. I have to get the information, what I did wrong, and how I can actually solve that so that I don't get disturbed in my workflow, but I get supported um, by, by resolving those issues and basically doing a good job in developing software. Ah, so actually it is giving you a hint during coding? So um, if you take like agile development where you are coding really, really fast, um, usually you have microservices that re relate to each other. You have many releases. Um, so basically what we are doing, we ensure that before every release, so before one version of your software gets shipped to the customers, um, it has a security check. Ah, and, and your tool automates the security check? Exactly. So the if you if you think of like the former days when you had software on CDs, it was really easy to get a manual penetration tester, like a security expert to your company, test the whole software, and when it was done, you resolved everything, you shipped a CD. And that's not possible anymore because these days we have web applications with so many releases and therefore you really need to automate the security part that's where we come in and how does your business model work and from where do you get all the vulnerabilities all the the the, the weak areas everything you're testing for where do you find that uh, i i assume you cannot buy it on amazon right Ah uh, no. <laughs> so what we are actually doing is the same thing that a manual penetration tester would do or which also the hackers are doing. So for some parts, we are um, using good open source tools which have a really good and focused test for a single vulnerability. Then we are using databases. So there are public databases for known vulnerabilities. So if you are using an old version of a software, just think of Windows XP or Windows 7. When there are known vulnerabilities, they are in a database. And if we detect something like that, we can just check with the database if there is a known vulnerability there. And then there are also security scans, which we totally write on our own because there are nothing really good existing out there. And how it's working in the end is that we have our software as a service, A security scanner which is running in the cloud and you as 
owner of a website um, of a web application. So for example, if you want to ensure that there are no vulnerabilities on startuprat.io, then you would register with us on our website, enter the details of your application and click on start scan. And then we would just go there and shoot on it, um, try to hack the database, try to inject code into your server. And if we are successful at one point, then we give you this information, like what we did, how we got in there, and how you can resolve it. And this is um, like the part of one scan. And then of course, for the automation, you really want to integrate it in your, uh, in your development life. So you can either just put their schedule so if you, for example, have nightly builds of your software, when you have one new software version every night, you can make sure that everyone is just uh, scanned for vulnerabilities by telling our software, please start a scan every morning. Or you can integrate it into your software development lifecycle if you're using tools already that automate your build of the software, then you can attach our scanner there so that it's triggering a scan every time something changes. And then basically we are selling that as a license. Um, you can a little bit compare it to a virus scanner where you buy a yearly license and then you have all the updates and you get secured for all the vulnerabilities that are there. Mm -hmm. I see. Sorry, had to resize you during the interview. Um, it, it, it's really strange. Never had that happen to me before. Um, nonetheless, I kind of get what you guys are doing. It's like a virus scanner for known vulnerabilities. Um, for everybody out there who's listening to this and doesn't know a lot about vulnerabilities and stuff like that, can you tell us like, the highlights where does something like this come from and would you recommend any company using um, software like Windows version that is not supported anymore uh, so first of all don't use any software that's not supported anymore yeah basically you just open yourself for attackers um, that's something which you can quite easily resolve and then there are other things which are more complicated, like writing your own software and ensuring that everything is secure there as well. And like the highlights of um, your security applications. I usually, if I do workshops, I have like a blackboard um, and I can draw stuff. I try to do it voice only now. Um, imagine you have um, a web application where you log in with your username and password. Then what an attacker can try is putting there uh, his own username and his own password. As the username, he enters administrator or root or anything which he would suspect to have high permissions in the system. And then for the for the password, he doesn't insert the real password, but enters a string which would be evaluated by the database. And it would basically be something like or one equals one. And then if that is not sanitized, but straight given to the database, it will evaluate the, uh, the request, which will then be something like, get every user from the database where the username is administrator and the password is empty or one equals one. And as one is always one, this one will evaluate to true and the attacker can lock with administrator permissions into your application. And those are the things where it's also really hard to detect them by just looking at software versions, because if you're writing the software yourself, there is no version uh, of it which would you would have known this vulnerability. So we are really trying to attack there and simulate those attack strings, like the one equals one, or even more complicated ones. Um, there are attack strings, which for example, have a sleep command in there. And then we check, is the server getting slower because he's sleeping? And if it's getting slower, then we know, okay, this got evaluated, we got access to the database. So it's really sophisticated attacks um, that we are doing here. And the amount is so big that it's really hard to do them manually as well. 
Mm -hmm. I see. Been resizing you again. Um, it's it's kind of scary when you tell what uh, all is possible out there. It kind of reminds me like uh, the hackers who use the standard passwords that are set by the factory, for example, to some Wi-Fi routers or stuff like that. And they actually try to see if somebody didn't do the work and change their password. But why would somebody put like a sleep command into a server? Um, so that's basically one thing which we are using to try out if the like the hacking attack is working. Um, but we've actually seen it just recently with a customer where somebody was sending sleep commands to their database as a DOS attack, denial of service. So the goal of the attacker was to take down the website because if every request has a sleep command, the CPU load gets high, the database is uh, probably working on stuff and if you want to access it as a normal user it won't respond and therefore the company is using uh, is losing money and as an attacker i can try to ransom them for example that means uh, you're slowing the website and basically they have to pay you in order to get it up and running fast again and not losing any revenue anymore Exactly, that's like one of the attacks where you could use a sleep command. Um, we are usually not doing that during our security scans because we don't want the customer's websites to break down. We are just using like this command once, see, is it working? And if it works, we know there would be the attack vector. And that's where I would go in if I was an attacker. And then we can tell that to the customer and he can... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your quality is currently pretty low. Really sorry for everybody who is viewing that and listening to it. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, but I was wondering, where do you find those vulnerabilities? Uh, you said there are some databases, but I do believe if you're only testing like for publicly known uh, stuff that is in databases, you couldn't make a business out of it, right? It's a really good question. And like when I'm giving workshops on like the basics of web security, um, I get similar questions all the time. And the really sad thing is that most of the issues have been there for 10 or 20 years. So if I'm an attacker, I could try to do some really new and sophisticated attack. But in the most cases, that's not even necessary because it just works if I write there or one equals one and it's getting executed in the database. Um, so then I don't really need more complicated attacks. And that's also why it's really important for our customer to have kind of this uh, the security scanner there because you can easily filter out all those things which are widely known, which are easy uh, to do, but still the focus for the developers is usually not security and many uh, many developers that we see they also don't have the knowledge that they would know from the beginning how to yeah, secu code, code securely because the the focus is usability the focus is speed but really rarely the focus is security hmm it's somehow shocking when you tell us that most of the use uh, of the vulnerabilities are there for more than a decade because I would have imagined it's like um, like two days ago and everybody was using that. Um, but if there are some vulnerabilities that have been there for 20 years, it's it's really scary, I got to tell you. And uh, but that's basically like I would I would assume it's like a, a mountain structure and you get most of the mountain with those tests and just the tip are the news vulnerabilities, right? Exactly. So basically, the thing that you're mentioning, like two days ago, that's what we call a zero day attacks, which are basically attacks that are unknown, um, that are people are doing that you can probably buy in the darknet. And if they get out, or if they get somehow known, then the manufacturer of the certain software will need to resolve them really, really fast. The problem for those things is, 
that the things that have been there for decades are the techniques. So if there is a zero day which is getting released these days, then basically the the techniques are really the same than that have been there for 10 years. And now I forgot. No, no, the, that's totally fine. Uh, we, unfortunately, we didn't see any improvement in your video quality. Um, and but we're already running at 20 minutes. You won't believe it. Um, I was I was just wondering, um, like the standard questions we have here, um, how you guys finance and are you looking currently for funding? So basically, we have some uh, business angels as investors in the company, um, which is really cool because we have, for example, one um, guy who is lecturing, has been lecturing at the ETH Zurich on cybersecurity. Um, so we have what they are doing and what we are doing, only have the money, but also their network and their expertise. Um, so. At this current moment, uh, we are not looking for for direct funding, but that probably or that may change within the next month again. You know how it is with startups. And for everybody who doesn't know, ETH Zurich is one of the universities where Albert Einstein was studying. So um, it's it's a very prestigious uh, institution here in the German speaking area. I, I always have to tell it because we've been in podcast chats of more than 26 countries and most people in South Korea um, or Uruguay don't know anything about those universities. Well, only thing left for me to say is Thank you very much and work on fast internet. <laughs> Thank you. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.